thank you everyone uh, for joining us today. And my name is Pook Tiravich Chainan and I'm uh, the co-director co of CFPR. And the format of today's seminar will be uh, somewhat different from our usual seminars. Instead of having our invited speakers uh, talk about their research, we have invited editors of two important journals in demography to share with us their views on pub publishing in population sciences. I have to say that this session sort of uh, inspired by uh, a similar session organized, uh, I think earlier this year and actually almost every year at the annual meeting of the Population of Association of America, um, where, you know, we get to meet with editors uh, that, uh, you know, like demography, population and development reviews or uh, uh, studies in family planning. So since many of us uh, were not able to attend uh, PAA, so we thought that it would uh, be good to do something similar or maybe the Asian version here so that researchers from Singapore and from Asia can be part of this conversation as well. So we are very honored to have uh, two speakers today. Our first speaker is uh, Professor Sarah Curran, who is the Editor-in-Chief of Demography which is the flagship journal of the Population Association of America. And Professor Curran is a professor of international studies, sociology, and public policy at the University of Washington. She is also the director of the Center for Studies in Demography and Ecology at UW. And she has researched and published wise, widely on issues related to gender, uh, migration and environment in many parts of the world. Um, and our second speaker is Professor Feng Shu Shu, uh, who is the Associate Editor of the Asian uh, Population Studies, which is the first international population journal that uh, focuses exclusively on uh, population issues in, uh, in Asia. So Professor Feng holds appointment in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at NUS. So many of, no, many of us know him well. Uh, he's also deputy head of the department, as well as the deputy director of CFPR. Uh, so he's currently vice president of the Population Association of Singapore, and his areas of expertise includes uh, aging and health, population studies, and economic sociology. Uh, so next slide, please. So many of you probably have seen this meme uh, floating around in the social media uh, this past week, right? So yes, uh, some manuscripts uh, do take a long time or a very long time to get published. So our panel discussion today will be about the process of manuscript review and publication, but, but, but it will also include uh, broader questions as well. So I have uh, come up with a few questions. Next slide, please that I would like to pose to two speakers and I would like to have each of them text turn answering these questions. But I would also welcome questions and comments from our audience. So if you have any uh, questions or comments that you want to ask uh, uh, Sarah and Trishu, please feel free to do so in the chat box during our panel discussion and I will try to mon monitor it. So the formats of today's seminar includes a 40 minutes uh, panel discussion and followed by Q&A. So now I would like to uh, start by inviting uh, Sarah and, and Shushu to uh, share their vision and mission of uh, demography and Asian population studies. So let's, uh, uh, so Sue, you can uh, close the, um, uh, yeah, and then maybe have Sarah and Shushu uh, here. So Sarah, oh. do you want to start first, maybe a few minutes talking about demography? Thanks. Thank you. I, I would like to invite Shushu because, uh, Shushi, because, um, uh, I think that you have some slides and we should just see your slides. <laughs> okay, sure. Shoo, shoo, <laughs> Sarah, I mean, most of the people coming here for you. La. <laughs> <laughs> I know, okay. but that's okay. okay. Don't worry. All right. Uh, anyway, uh, okay. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, it's my uh, pleasure to present with Sarah, uh, you know, to talk about the view from editors on, on, on journals, uh, particularly on behalf of uh, APS. 
I would like to share with you some of uh, the information of APS. Uh, because unlike uh, the top journal of uh, uh, demography, APS grown up recent years. And we truly hope like uh, uh, more of the researchers, particularly from Asia, could submit their research, uh, research to us. And therefore I prepare some uh, uh, slides to share with you. Uh, okay. Uh, I would like to say uh, our founding the, uh, uh, editor, uh, the APS was founded by Professor Gavin Jones. And uh, very sadly, he passed away in the previous months. And this is what he wrote at the very beginning of the journal uh, about uh, 17 years ago. Uh, the very rationale of APS uh, as a professor uh, Gavin Jones say uh, the journal was established for several reasons. And one of the reasons is, um, uh, first of all, uh, the uh, Asian uh, is so important. Uh, the Asian population has a large weight for the total world population. And in the foreseeable future, I think the Asian population will cons consistently take about 60% of the world total population. However, you know, uh, particular research on Asia is due relatively short in relative uh, to in relation to you know in contrast to uh, uh, publications from the other continent and and also um, uh, the author uh, uh, the author from Asia you know many of uh, the Asian countries you know focus on publish in their own language the international so they don't join the international community I think things has been changed a lot yeah but this is uh, what we have been perceiving about uh, 10, 20 years ago. Uh, that's why Professor Gavin Jones uh, started this journal and particularly focused on population issues in Asia. And uh, as you can see, this is really a demographic journal covering all aspects of demography. And some of the major topics we are interested in has been listed here from the population trend uh, uh, to marriage, aging, family planning, migration and to policy and interventions. And we currently have a large editorial board and the chief uh, uh, editor is Professor Bana Yu. And you can see on our editorial board, you can see many familiar names and some of them are our colleagues from AUS. We have started to publish from two, uh, 2005 and uh, each year, we publish three issues, so about 20 papers. Uh, you can see we did not publish a lot for each year. So, so far until now, we have uh, totally published 342 papers, including uh, five special issues. And uh, thanks to the effort and contribution of uh, our authors, uh, uh, APS has grown up in terms of impact factor uh, so we are now about, uh, you know, 1.95 uh, uh, in terms of impact factors. And I would like to, at the very last, I would like to say I, uh, the mission of IPS is to, uh, to report uh, demographic findings from Asia. And as you can see, we got a lot of publications from South Asia, uh, particularly from India. And also our publication, these are some examples. You can see the study from Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. And another major region we focus is East Asia. We got a lot of paper from China and Korea. And we also publish on Japan, Mongolia, and North Korea. And APS is in Southeast Asia. There, that's why we got a lot of paper published uh, in this region including Singapore, Indonesia, Vietnam, Thailand, Malaysia, and Cambodia, Myanmar, and Philippines. And also uh, sometimes we got papers published about Australia, uh, uh, particularly in relation to the migration. And we also have papers uh, published about the Middle East and also the, uh, the, the West, West Asia, Middle Asia, Central Asia. You can see we have papers on Kuwait, uh, on Oman, on Yemen, on Iran. And we start to receive uh, publication uh, papers from Kazakhstan, 
and then general Central Asia. So that's a very brief introduction about our journal. And because today we are going to talk about OA, open access, and APS is also having the option of open access. I think the issue we need to discuss in detail later, but uh, so far uh, APS publish uh, at a rate of about 3,085 if you choose to publish your paper with open access. And that's it, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Rishu. Uh, Sarah, I know like you have taken on this uh, uh, heading the editorial board at uh, um, uh, Demography recently, and uh, you know, in your uh, role as uh, editor in chief, uh, what kind of views you have for demography in the next few years? Well, thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, thank you, Fulk. I'm really glad to be on the panel today. And I thought the introduction by um, Asian Population Studies and Guishu was, was great and helpful. And I'm glad you went first. <laughs> um, I uh, obviously demography is um, is been around for a lot longer, and um, and has a repu certain reputation. Um, I think what's been most as an, I've only been in the job for three months, so I'm still learning the ropes to say to say the least. What I've noticed um, in terms of both what we are publishing, which really is a pipeline of work that was managed by Mark Hayward before me, um, is that in so including all the sub manuscripts that have come in since I've started, that the um, the diversity of subject matters, the diversity of the locations of the research is really vast. I mean, the disciplines and the, and the subjects and the topics and the geographic locations are about as diverse, you know, beyond take the subjects that you saw in APS and, and go around the entire world and you see them in demography. It proved, it's really proving to be quite challenging to, um, to define what is, what, is, what is a good fit for the journal. Um, and I, I'm finding that to be the hardest part of the job right now in terms of getting my feet around it, uh, getting my head and feet into it. Um, we get, uh, in demography, we get about 650 manuscript submissions a year. And, um, and we have, uh, we, right now we have 35 deputy editors and about 30 editorial board members. I'm planning on growing both board, both the deputy editor team and the editorial board team by another 10 to 15 people on both sides because we expect all editorial board members to review one manuscript a month. And uh, for the deputy editors, they're supposed to be uh, managing uh, a little bit more than that, sort of two or three manuscripts or stewarding them through, through the year and getting them uh, reviewed and out the door. So it's a fairly hefty workload. Um, and, and I think in part, um, that's good. That's a good sign because it's seen as a demography and the journal is seen as a great outlet um, and has a good reputation. I think it's a moment in which as a community, we should perhaps be thinking about what is the boundary around which we've always amongst many demographers in, in, in the US anyway, the, there's a sense of being a big tent, a large tent, an inviting tent, that we, we all really care about getting the right uh, denominator and understanding various, uh, the nature of population dynamics in relation to many social challenges and social topics, social science topics. But um, it's, uh, you know, it, Drawing that boundary is quite, it, it, I think is gonna become even more important as we move along. So for example, I've been noticing that one of the areas in which we're getting a fair number of submissions is around the issue of mental health. 
Mm. Um, and population level studies of mental health concerns. In part, that's emergent out of the, you know, the pandemic and um, all the concerns around the pandemic. So I think there were a few publications, uh, a few manuscripts that were published in demography that did address mental health. The other part of mental health is aging and cognitive abilities. And the question is to what extent when do we, you know, do we, are those part of what we would consider demography? Mm -hmm. um, and I would, I would be curious to hear what the audience thinks about the boundaries between, uh, you know, how big a tent are we in, mm -hmm. in, uh, in the field? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we could, perhaps we could talk about it. I mean, it seems, I, yeah, I think that's, to me, that's one of the things that I've been struggling with. If we're, for me, one of the challenges is that as um, I, I review all of the manuscripts that come in and I make a first round decision on whether or not there's a fit. And so that's one place in which I have some control over it. Um, as we, as, you know, as I send something out for review to the deputy editors, they make a decision whether to reject, desk reject or send it out to reviewers. And again, that's a moment in which the deputy editors might make a call about whether or not this is a good fit for demography, whether a manuscript is a good fit for demography. Um, and then the final way in which we might sort of organically see the boundaries being drawn is when reviewers <clears throat> are, what, how hard it is to find a reviewer who knows the journal demography and can review the subject matter. Mm -hmm. So um, at that point, we may run into some issues of um, getting good, timely, qualified reviews that that work for for our journal. OK, um, that's it. Sorry, it was going on too long. No, no, no. That's that's great. Uh, now that you know, you talk about the process, uh, the real review process of demography, maybe Shushu can share how what's it's like at APS. Uh, and you know, like how many manuscript you review a year or how many you reject? Uh, what, what, what are the process at APS? Uh, uh, sorry, I don't have the official statistics, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think uh, similar to uh, the comments uh, from Sarah that uh, we also have a lot of submission, particularly from the Asia regions. Mm -hmm. uh, to my estimation, we, uh, reject about, uh, uh, you know, uh, seven papers, you know, uh, out of uh, 10. Yeah, wow. something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, our review procedure is, uh, uh, I believe, is quite similar to uh, demography. Mm -hmm. We usually send our paper to uh, three uh, uh, reviewers. And uh, we usually uh, count on our uh, editorial board members uh, for the review. And uh, uh, Brenda is the chief uh, editor. We will we'll do the, uh, the initial evaluation mm -hmm. and then we will send it out for review. And uh, uh, usually we will make the judgment within uh, one or two months. Yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. I'm a little bit, I lost my train of thoughts. I, you know, so uh, thinking along what, what, with what you, you have to say. So do you have to, I mean, for question for both of you, right? So do you have to strike a balance in terms of geographical representation? I know like, you know, I mean, for when for Asian, I mean, research, researcher published on Asia, and I just uh, talked about this to my class earlier today, we felt like, I mean, at least for me, right? I felt like if I want to publish in demography or maybe some sort of, you know, we have to just define, right? Why our, I mean, why Thailand is important, right? Or how it contributes to theory. So that's my question to you, probably to you, Sarah. I mean, like, whereas if, yeah. you, if you use US data, right? You don't have to go, I mean, justify. I mean, it's it's already, and some, sometimes it seems like, it seems that my impression is that way. So please correct me if I'm right or wrong. And the other thing is, the second question is, how do you balance for both of you, right? Uh, I mean, geographical representation, right? Because you tend to get probably a lot of submission from China, India, or maybe Western countries, where Southeast Asia, you probably have, uh, or other regions, you probably have fewer uh, submission. 
Yeah, well, I'll start and, and you can jump in and say what, uh, uh, from the perspective of APS, but um, I, you know, there's nothing in demography that says we should be representing geographically, you know, representative across mm -hmm. the globe in any way. Um, the, I, I think it is what you were pointing to at the end of your comments, Hook, is that um, we get many more submissions. Uh, I would say we get more submissions from, from uh, scholars who are writing about the US or writing, they're not necessarily American scholars, but mm -hmm. scholars writing about the US and using US data or European data. Increasingly, a lot of um, administrative data you know, linked files data from from Europe. And then I would say the third most common cluster is China, China, articles about China, um, and then India. And then, um, then we have a smattering across the rest of the globe. Um, and that's in terms of submissions, not in terms of accepted manuscripts. Um, in terms of scholars from, um, from, different parts of the world. I do think we have a, you know, a real tendency to have people who have American teams that are made up of Americans or teams that are made up of Europeans mm -hmm. um, and Chinese scholars is among the submitted manuscripts. Um, I would say very few single authored articles nowadays. So it mm -hmm. would be hard to say M much more team science that's happening in around the, around the, in these manuscripts. I think that's in part because the data that are being employed are new data. They require specialized techniques. You need different kinds of people to help you produce an article, mm -hmm. uh, say using genetic data, bio, mm -hmm. biomarker data or administrative data. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so it's really about the, the extent to, so when, you know, in the first round, probably Brenda does the same thing. In the first round of, I'm, I'm really looking for whether the data are population, you know, population-based data mm -hmm. and the extent to which the authors are actually referencing in their citations or in their introductions or in their framework that they have any represent any notion of demographic processes or they're referencing demographic journals, whether that's a Asian population studies or demography or population development review. You know, there are, it's pretty easy when you see an art, see a manuscript come in and there's not a single reference to any demographic process. That's pretty much of us, you know, uh, not going to accept it. Mm -hmm. So you would, you would hope that the authors are thinking about writing, pr presenting a study that speaks to the audience that reads demography. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that's the main, the main thing that I'm most interested in is being able to present high quality work that the audience is interested, that, my, that the readership is interested in. True. Okay. Yeah. So not so much about trying to balance whatever that, I, I mean, you know, the geographic uh, representation. No, I mean, if it's good data, if it's, it seems to be a population level study, it's new mm -hmm. and interesting data, it's a, maybe a new methodological technique, mm -hmm. or maybe it's a, you know, a compelling question around mm -hmm. that, that has been of interest demographically, it doesn't matter where it's from. Okay. And it's, and it's well done work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Shushu? Yeah, um, I agree with Sarah that, uh, you know, uh, our audience should be the, 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 the most important concern. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but for APS, at least, uh, you know, just for my personal point of view, I, I feel uh, uh, from the very uh, start of APS, we are trying to make a voice from Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why uh, I think uh, uh, in publishing the papers, we are really trying to encourage publication from some of the you know areas which never got any demographic report or analysis, uh, and and that's why uh, you know uh, we do welcome uh, more papers from uh, uh, Central and West Asia, which has been published and analyzed relatively less 
in the field. Uh, so uh, we do have that concern. But going back to that, I think quality is very important. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I say quality, I think uh, specifically from APS point of view, we are trying very hard to judge the quality of a paper by firstly uh, to see uh, the importance of this topic uh, for, uh, uh, for the population they address. And number two, we truly highlight the communication between the, uh, the, the paper with the general theoretical framework, which is mostly built up based on the Western data. Uh, so this is the reality. That's why we really want to see the communication. We want to see our audience will enjoy the uh, study from Asia, but also uh, the implication of the Asian findings to the general uh, demography, uh, particularly to the Western uh, you know, theories. We mm -hmm. hope to encourage that kind of interaction. Mm -hmm. And that's why we do highlight uh, yeah, a very solid uh, theoretical framework mm -hmm. instead of like simply just based on a specific nation to report what's going on in this nation. And that's mm -hmm. important for us. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. Do I just want to add, I want to, yeah. I think this is a really important point. Um, you know, it, it does have all, it's all different kinds of in knowledge production. There's a whole range of different kinds of knowledge production, but really truly advancing our fields as, as Tushu was just saying, it has to be driven by theory and evidence and hypothesis testing and this is, I think, what you've articulated about the goal of APS is super important that, that we bring to bear the evidence and the material and the science that the discoveries in Asia mm -hmm. and put them up against an intellectual scientific tradition because then we'll all be better off if we have a yes. better sense of scientifically. And I think that's a wonderful goal yeah. and very important. Yeah. So I think, uh, apart, yeah, thank you for, for that comment. I mean, comments, those comments. So apart from this, you know, like this uh, academic rigor, are there any sort of substantive areas in demography that each of your journal uh, would like to uh, encourage? And this, my question also extend to like, you know, some journals now have special issues, right? But I don't. I never seen demographies doing it. I know um, APS doesn't do it frequently as well, and yeah. that's when you know it seems like journals may want to focus on area like climate change or maybe yeah. aging and family or something like that, or maybe even mental health or cognitive health. Uh, maybe you can both. You can comment on that if you had that in mind. <laughs> I know. I have had several people ask me about it and I'm, I am, I do have some inclination. It would be a big change for demography to have mm -hmm. special issues. And I'm not sure if the special issue would should, should, or would be, a, could be around a subject area like mm -hmm. climate change or whether it should be around something core, you know, fundamentally about demography and demographic. Mm -hmm methods, um, maybe something more at the foundation of the field. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm just not, I'm not sure. <laughs> and I'd be curious to hear what the audience thinks about that. I did notice APS has had a few special issues. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, for APS, we also have uh, the same concern. We do not publish a lot of special issues. Uh, for one of the reason is, uh, yeah, as Sapuk mentioned, the publication priority. Um, Asia is very uh, diversified in terms of demography. Uh, in the East Asia, uh, Japan, uh, you know, uh, and Korea, the demographic transition uh, has almost, you know, to a new stage. But uh, for many other parts, you know, the, the decline of fertility just happened, particularly in Southeast, even within Southeast Asia, you can see, the pictures are very, very uh, diversified. I mean, Singapore is very uh, different from uh, Indonesia and Myanmar. And, and that makes uh, th this fact, you know, uh, we have uh, very different priorities in different nations. And therefore the researchers uh, always pick up different type of uh, topics. 
uh, which is very hard for us to say this is the direction or this is uh, the priority. Needless to say, there's uh, very fancy topics coming up, like uh, mm -hmm. Sarah mentioned, uh, uh, climate change and A AI, big data, uh, biomarkers, and all of this uh, make demography very exciting field. So we try our best now to point out a focus of a publication. Okay. Yeah. But it's all like if I you, think what I I was gonna s just say Paul quickly in yeah. in that um I think the fact that demography is now online mm -hmm. on open access in fact that means that there are different ways to bundle articles so we can we don't they don't all have to be I mean they're presented in an mm -hmm. issue right. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But they can be repackaged into a series. And exactly. that, that is something that, that is something that the um, the Duke University Press is working mm -hmm. on so that if you wanted to have a series of articles on aging, mm -hmm. you right. could find some great articles in in demography that you could put all together in one right. in one collection. Yeah. yeah. May, may I add a comment so that that's a brilliant idea. Actually, APS is going that way. Uh, basically, we find uh, the publisher finds some topic very fancy. We then organize, the, we call it a virtual special issue. Yeah, to uh, compile them together. Yeah. Hmm. That's okay. great. Now that um, Sarah mentioned open access, right? And I know demography become open access recently. And please co correct me, like uh, authors do not need to pay, right? That $3,000 or $4,000 to have their articles open access at in demography? Uh, there is a manuscript fee uh, mm -hmm. to get your article published. You can request, you, it's a voluntary. Uh -huh. Oh, I <laughs> um, thought it's completely free. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but, at, but so open access does require payments, mm -hmm. but for, for the authors, mm -hmm. Um, but, and you can get a discount if your university or your institution has pay, paid a, paid into the Duke University Press mm -hmm. package. Uh -huh. um, and, but you can also, but open access really means that the readers can get mm -hmm. access to the article. Right. So readers of the journal can get access to it and they don't have to pay. I thought demography entirely, I mean, the entire journal is open access, right? So is that correct? No, we we chart, we chart ask people to pay for their manuscripts. Ah, okay. <laughs> not right. everybody does. Uh -huh. but, but that's it's, not- It yeah. can't be because there's no, it, we have to have, we have to charge. So you have to charge to submit. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a minimal fee to submit a manuscript. Mm -hmm. And then once you go through the publication process. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Got it. Okay. So that leads to my next questions, right? Uh, what, what does this movement uh, towards uh, more open access and, you know, open access journals, what does this mean to uh, population uh, sciences? <clears throat> Uh, well, in my opinion, it, mm -hmm. it, um, it's a good, it's a good thing. Um, it re increases readership mm -hmm. and I think that's an important, um, you know, that's very important that we make our science more available, more accessible. Um, and that's, you know, that's absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the challenge is how do you pay for editing, copy editing? Mm -hmm. And um, so <laughs> I think that the, 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 the production of is not, you know, the production is not free and somebody has to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, I think that the figuring out how that happens has mm -hmm. is, is not yet clear. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just double checking the charges, but it's a thousand dollars to pay. Standard article processing fee is a thousand dollars. I see. Wow. For demography, uh -huh. yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's that doesn't really cover the full cost of mm -hmm. actually yeah. all the editing that has to happen in the production. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Shushu, do you have anything to add? I mean, yeah, I have a, I have, I have a, actually one comments and a, one question for Sarah and you. Uh, for me, open access is the trend, uh, and which is uh, which will uh, benefit all of us as researchers, because open open access is to give the copyright mm -hmm. to the author instead of the publisher, and to share this with the public, and to in order to reduce the revenue of the publisher. That's my understanding of open access movement. Right. Uh, I feel a little bit troublesome is because uh, it looks like current the publishing business is also trying to take advantage of this. And uh, I know this will never happen for demography or APS, but uh, because of open access, there's some uh, predatory journals uh, comes out um, producing low quality publications. Mm -hmm. And that might be a problem for open access journals. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my, my whole question is about this. Uh, when we talk about this uh, publication of a paper, that's really a joint effort, not only by the author and then the editor, but also a joint effort by the reviewers. And the very reason, as Sarah mentioned, uh, sometimes it's hard to find uh, very good reviewers. I think it's because uh, the reviewer's time and contribution has not been uh, substantially acknowledged. I think that will be an issue in the long run. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a very small tip. Nowadays, I find uh, for APS, many of my uh, active reviewers are usually those people who are uh, uh, very uh, in their initial stage of career. Yeah, they want to build up their reputation. And I know that uh, demography may not have that kind of problem. But for a journal in, in, in my stage, I mean, as APS, we, it is relatively hard for us to get, uh, you know, the top person to review for us, uh, that's a real problem, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do we deal with it, huh, Sarah? <laughs> what can we do? <laughs> yeah, I, th I, think you're, I think you're spot on in terms of the recognition of, for reviewers. Um, yeah. um, there was the group Publons, which was mm -hmm. collecting um, and keeping a record and, and published and keeping a record of how many reviews you had done. And I thought that was a very good service just to be mm -hmm. able to include that in your in your annual annual review um and that that is a possibility but i don't know i'm i i do think we have we have a real challenge sometimes finding reviewers getting timely reviews um mm -hmm. and even getting some of the top people to review for us we do have we do have i mean we do have good reviewers but it can be difficult mm -hmm. And you have to be careful and you don't want to send them a paper that is a poor quality paper. So you just want to be mindful of the respectful of their time mm -hmm. and, and not, not overburden them. Um, yeah. I don't have an answer. <laughs> I think you gave a good, um, on the open access. I completely agree. There are, um, journals that are popping up low quality journals and the, one of the ways in which their cost cutting and saving money is they're not doing a very good job copy editing. Mm -hmm. And then you don't have a very good, you know, and then you're also not check, checking for all the other things that you need to check for plagiarism right? and all the other things that are possible with articles. And that's a problem. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. I mean, I have some other questions, but I, I, I think like, I would like to uh, open the floor to our, um, our audience and see if anyone have questions. Uh, so you can raise your hand or uh, put your question into the chat box. Um, so, so Sarah, if you Joy, can, Joy, yeah. Joy asked a question yeah. about, yeah. So when you're not charged for your article, but the article processing fee is, for an author is a thousand dollars. So that's different than you. You still you you will retain uh, copyright and full publishing without uh -huh. restriction and et cetera. So I can drop the link to you for that section for authors fees and 
would that discourage like uh you know students and you and scholars from uh, developing countries because a thousand dollars is quite a lot too. Yeah. So what happens is that your I think the wording is um, there is a standard article processing fee of a thousand, um, mm -hmm. but you can usually ask. Um, you can usually ask for a waiver. Mm -hmm. um, so you can request a waiver. You'll see in the next paragraph here and this thing that I'm going to drop you drop mm -hmm. into the so you don't and then that is available to anybody. You can make any any claim you want about and certainly students don't have to. Students automatically get waived. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyone else have uh, questions? Uh, feel free to raise your hand. And it could be questions to, uh, okay, I think Daniel. Uh, Daniel, Daniel yeah. do you want to uh, uh, open your mic and, and ask your questions? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. I'm not, bl I'm not blurring out my laundry room here. It's, it's all clean laundry. <laughs> Trust me. Um, just a couple uh, uh, comments. As Sarah, you mentioned um, you're thinking about like the scope of what demography should cover. Yeah. You mentioned mental health. One of my favorite articles from yesteryear was on uh, tornadoes and uh, tornadoes and, and human settlements. I think it was uh, somewhat mm -hmm. at the University of, uh, of Washington. So sometimes, you know, you can take a chance perhaps on a topic that, you know, other editors might not accept something on that. Um, I have, I have great admiration for what both you guys do. It's not an easy job. Um, uh, my question is what, let's see, you, when you send something out to a re reviewer, you say, do you like this article? Do you not like this article? Revise and resubmit. And then they come back with some summary recommendations. What do you do when you disagree with the majority, uh, that comes back to you? If everybody says they like it and you come to a different assessment um, um, or they say reject it and you think that they were inaccurate, um, are there pressures that you feel from other, well, like PA, uh, demography is an association journal. So um, yeah. they're kind of looking over your shoulders, others are independent. Um, how would you react to this um, issue? Yeah. So I'll, do, I'll give you a couple examples um, recently, but I don't think I have enough under my belt to get maybe she, she has better um, ideas or experience, more experience. But um, my, so one, one case, one kind of case is that um, I'll get, I'll get either a very major revise and resubmit and a rejection. And essentially they're saying, they're, they're both basically very negative about the article. And, um, and then the deputy editor who has been managing the reviews sends me an equivocal cover note that says I, you know, doesn't really tell me what to do. So then I, um, what I have done sometimes is double checked with the deputy editor. Also, I've checked with the reviewer, but I will often, if it's a major revise and resubmit and a reject and the deputy editor is sort of unsure what to do. Um, I have sometimes told the author, typically what's, what's wrong with the article is that it's, its claims are far bigger than the evidence that it provided, even though the evidence was quite, was quite strong or there was good evidence in the paper, but the paper kind of made very large claims and didn't actually wasn't able to follow through with all the claims in the, in the, in the, with the evidence. So I've, I've actually told them, I, I recommend to you, you know, these, this is what you got. The, there was a major revise and resubmit. There was a rejection. Um, in, in essence, the art, the reviewers are saying that they felt like you didn't really quite follow through with what you said you were going to follow through, but this is still a kind of a good article. So my recommendation is narrow the scope, submit it again as a new article with a narrower scope, and you've got a lot of work. To, you still can, you know, we can start again with a whole new review process. Um, 
and try to be encouraging in that sense. Mm -hmm. I, it's rare that I have not been in the situation where I've seen a article, sent an article to a deputy editor and had the deputy editor then send out for review where either I or the deputy editor were already sort of negative about the article. I think if in that case, uh, and then the reviews came back positive. I think in our in that case, if we were already sort of negative about it, then probably it wouldn't have gone out for a review to begin with. Um, I that that would be my guess, but I just haven't run into that case myself situation. But I don't feel like PAA is looking over my shoulder. I feel like the process there's enough of really good people looking at a paper with from different angles that you you generally get you you can figure out what the what the so what is and whether to you know encourage a revision or or tell them to suggest that they go somewhere else where where there maybe is a better home better fit yeah um yeah. does that answer your question daniel uh yeah, it, it, it does. Um, can, can I find it? Does anybody else have a question? I could follow up on that one if nobody else has got a question. Yeah. I think there's, okay, uh, okay why, don't you, why don't you go first? Yeah, if you want to follow on what um, Sarah okay. has to say. Uh, I'm going to uh, make this comment. I'm, I'm joining this uh, meeting as an independent, not under my official hat, so I just want to make that clear. Um, I'm going to use myself <laughs> as a case study um, and it's not about the it's not about the demography controversy, Sarah. Uh, it's one before <laughs> that. It's one before that where um, I had an article out on review. There were the first journal rejected it. The second one accepted it. There were eight peer reviews that came back. Seven argued that they didn't want it published, and the editors published it, and it was the lead article in that issue. So uh, I guess that's inspiring. This question: What do you do when you have a major disagreement with the reviews that come back. And, um, you know, maybe that was a rare case, but um, yeah, so there, there yeah. you have it. What, what do you do? I mean, how do you, if majority is going to rule most of the time, um, but, you know, how do you, yeah. how do you advance the field when everybody is aligned against a certain point of view? Yeah, I mean, that. I think it, um, I, if it were me and I just haven't run into that situation yet, um, I would be asking one of my senior deputy editors to read the article with me. And we would, we would have a conversation about the article in relation to the, to the reviews. And I feel comfortable enough with some of my senior deputy editors to be able to say, you know, let's think about, is this something that will push the field? Um, uh, and is it important to get it out there even, you know, despite the reviews? <clears throat> um, but I haven't, I haven't run into that yet. So I, I, I'm sure I will. Okay. Congrats on that article, <laughs> Daniel. Um, so I have two, two questions in the chat box. One is a student um, from Africa, but he studied in at IPSR in, in Thailand, and he asked if APS will consider published articles from Africa. Uh, yes, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, I think like uh, the very rationale of APS is to promote uh, you know, uh, the voice uh, from non-Western contacts. So you are very welcome to submit to us, although our major focus is on Asia, yeah, yeah. Okay. And the second question, this is for both of you. Uh, do you consider uh, qualitative studies uh, where there's no generalization on population? Like it's very specific, right? To particular group or particular ethnics. Would you consider, have you published qualitative studies before? Yeah. I, I think you have, I, I don't, demography, has hasn't so hasn't published solely qualitative studies. They have published mixed methods where you might combine a population level study with qualitative findings, um, but not um, not a, a solely qualitatively based 
research project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. APS? Uh, uh, we are almost the same, uh, but I would like to say APS uh, do welcome uh, Stalys uh, somehow based on historical archives to talk about the policy. And uh, for example, we published uh, several papers on uh, uh, fertility policy and then aging policies. And we also have a commentary, uh, you know, uh, type of uh, articles, welcome those kind of historical based, uh, you know, studies. And for very ethnographical studies, uh, I would like to suggest to consider more uh, of the journal related to anthropology. Yeah, yeah, or historical studies, yeah. Okay. Are there more questions? Uh, or anyone want to ask question, you can raise your hand. Okay, I think people, oh, so wrong, please go ahead. If you can turn on your camera, that'd be great. Sorry, my, my camera here is not working. So I will, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Maybe you introduce yourself a little bit and yes. then- uh, um, I'm Xiaorong. I'm Xiaorong and a graduate from NUS and a, a researcher for quite some time uh, within US as well. And currently, um, um, I mean, my experience of publishing started off from a quite bumpy <laughs> uh, start because I, I mean, this this question might be a little bit uh, sensitive because I had a, a two experiences published uh, submitting to the journals, um, um, a, a few rounds of R and R, and still I got rejections and. Um, I got the sense that the tone and how you show your def def difference or respect to the to the reviewers, sometimes their views might be quite uh, well, we objective. And uh, I, I, I think probably there is a kind of protocol uh, in terms of way you speak to reviewers and way for your respect. Is it? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it seems like someone need to uh, mute themselves. Right. Is it wrong? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so I mean, this might be not the 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 formal rule. Maybe some kind of hidden rule. So, is that a kind of protocol or an an understanding that authors should comply as much as possible? and as being polite as possible to reviewers. Otherwise you'll be rejected. Thank you. Thank you um, to the two editors. I really enjoy um, your conversation. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah. I think um, as Tushi was saying earlier, um, you know, reviewers do this work um, pro bono. You know, they don't, they do it because they care about the field and they want to keep up with the field and they want to um, build, yeah, they may build their reputation as being good scientists and, and, and contributing to the public good. So in return, as an author, one has to just assume that their comments are meant in good stead and, and, and they should be treated with respect. And, um, and yes, and if an author, if a reviewer is making a suggestion, um, you know, one has to take it seriously as an author. Now, it could be that the reviewer missed the point or misunderstood the data or misunderstood the purpose of the article. And so their suggestion may not be relevant, but nevertheless, you can still be respectful in replying back to them. That's just good practice whether or not you're, um, if whether you're submitting, you're re, you know, getting comments back on a re proposal or on, a, on an article. Um, I, I don't think there's a, I think when, when authors convey what I would say sort of, sort of a crankiness around being, I, I think it's important just to try to put your emotional feeling aside and just try to reply as frank, matter of factly as possible um you know and you can vent 
outside of it. And but in terms of the interaction with the reviewer, it's best to just not not get cranky, yeah. <laughs> as they say. Yeah. That's very good advice. Yeah. We have one, uh, um, um, Miss uh, Doctor Ahmed. Do you want to raise your questions? Uh, maybe you can introduce yourself briefly. Hi. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I'm Atik. I'm from uh, Bangkok. I'm associated with IPSR and also a professional with Asian Disaster Preparedness Center. I'm doing my research in the nexus of uh, climate change and demographic uh, issues. So my question here is basically, uh, I'm very encouraged actually to see this uh, interaction uh, and actually move forward with some publications as well. My interest is uh, quite a lot in the nexus between climate change and uh, uh, contributions and vice versa with the demographic components. Uh, what I'm saying, demographic intricacies. So as we can see more and more interest is growing uh, into this area of work from the demographic and population studies as well. But uh, in general, the, we see the publications are not that much. So my question is how far you encourage to forward uh, our publications related to these, uh, to your, uh, you know, journals, as well as if you have any guidance. Thank you. Well, I do think, um, you know, anything to do with climate and demographic change is going to be very welcome in many of our journals. There is, of course, the Population and Environment, the journal, which is a very good um, journal for this subject for those subject matters um, but but truly as um, Daniel mentioned there was a great paper a couple years ago on tornadoes and and settlements in the United States several papers now on on climate change and population change and in, in demography so I, I I think it's gonna I'm sure it's also true in APS that it's a welcome subject at that particular intersection yeah Shushu, do you want to say? Yeah, we are very interested in this topic. And then so far, we don't have uh, many paper. So you are very welcome to uh, submit. Yeah. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, let's see if there's any one last question. So if not, I would like you to, I mean, each of you to offer maybe one practical advice. I mean, I think in this room, there's a lot of aspiring um, researchers who would like to get their works published in demography and APS. Do you have any yeah. last advice before we wrap up here? Well, one thing is, I, I have two things to say. One thing is, That's great. Um, uh, don't be discouraged if you get rejected um, from demography. Uh, what I'm trying to do every time I send a rejection letter is to make a suggestion for another journal. So I give very specific suggestions for where you might send your article for another. So don't, don't, wait, don't wait too long before sending it back out. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is we have a practice in demography because we have a relatively high rejection rate. Um, once we send something out for review and it gets a revise and resubmit, that bar is very high, high, high to get a revise and resubmit. Um, but once you get one, we're not. It's very unlikely that we're going to reject it. You will. You may ask you to revise and resubmit several times over. But once you've made it to that point, you've made it really far. So don't be discouraged by a revise and resubmit from demography. It's really a good sign. Great. Uh, Shushu? Uh, sorry, Pooh, can I have uh, uh, two comments on this yes. rather than one? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay, well, my first comment is, uh, yeah, I believe uh, many of the, our audience are uh, young scholars. Uh, I would like to say publication is uh, uh, communication with your community. Uh, so uh, when you firstly start your publication career, uh, just try your best to learn about how to communicate well. And this is also a part of your own research. That's my first comments. My second comments are uh, very personal. Uh, I hope like uh, while you got rejection from demography, uh, think about APS first. 
<laughs> That's great. But I have to say, I mean, I'm, I'm reviewers for both journals, right? And I learned so much, uh, uh, for, I mean, from, from reviewing uh, for, for, for you, I mean, uh, reviewing for, for your journals. And I find like the practice of uh, sharing comments from other uh, reviewers back to the, you know, one of the reviewers are actually very helpful. And I learned a lot uh, through that process. So thank you so much, uh, both of you. I hope like everyone take away uh, some advice and you know feel encouraged uh, to do good work and submit to either uh, demography or uh, APS in the future. So by way of closing this uh, seminar, so I'd like to thank Sarah and Chushu again uh, for sharing your advice, your wisdom with us. And for the audience for, um, you know, your active participation and staying on with us for a whole hour. So, um, so I want to advertise the next, our next seminar. For those of you who are in Singapore, uh, on 27 of September, we will invite uh, Jim Ramo, Professor Jim Ramo from uh, Princeton University. So he will be on campus and will give a talk uh, at CFPR. So do join us if you're in Singapore. So until then, uh, stay safe and have a nice day. Thank you so much, uh, Shushu and, and, and Sarah. Re really appreciate Bye. it. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, Sarah. Bye. 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 Thank you. Right. Thank Bye. you very much.